Mizmul Asaf, El Elohim Adonai, Diver Vaikara Aretz. God the Lord speaks and summons the earth from the place of the sun's rising to the place of its going down. Out of Zion, the completion of beauty, God shines. Our God comes and will not be silent. Before him is a consuming fire. Storm winds whirl around him. He calls unto the heavens above and unto the earth to judge his people. Gather to me, my beloved ones, who have made a covenant with me of sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. Hear, my people, and I will speak. Israel, I will protest against you. I am God, your God. I do not chide you for your sacrifices. Your burning sacrifices are constantly before me. I receive no young bulls from your household, no he-goats from your pens, for all the living creatures of the forest are mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the creeping things of the field are in my care. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its produce are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Make a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. Make good your vows to the Most High. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will rescue you, and you will glory in me. But to the wicked, God says, What business have you to recite my laws and to take my covenant in your mouth? You who hate discipline, who hurl my words behind you. When you see a thief, you are well pleased with him. Your chosen life is with adulterers. You let loose your mouth for evil. Your tongue designs deceit. You sit speaking against your brother. You malign your own mother's son. These things you did... And I kept silent. You really thought, I am like you. I will correct you and set out the charge in front of your eyes. I beg you to consider, you who forget God, lest I tear you up and there is no one left to save you. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving glories in me and prepares a way where I will show him the salvation of God. So, Sue, I mean, one of the things that you you talk about, I was really fascinated in um, in just the, the way this psalm has been received, is the the um, the Targum in the, in the the Jewish the translation of, of, of this talks about the 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 the, um, the sacrifices, and there's this. Wonderful bit about the you know the sacrifice in in the in the in the um, psalm, but it it refers it very much to um, you know since the day when the house of my Shekinah was destroyed, I have not accepted from your hand an ox or goat from your fold, which is is very, very extraordinary, isn't it? Yes, it's, it is. Particularly in the light of the fact we've been looking at Psalms 42 and 3, which, you know, I wish I could be at the temple, how important it is to be in that sort of uh, service. And 46 about Zion. Here we have something quite different, which is really not rejecting sacrifice. I don't think it's about that, but actually the song of thanksgiving, the attitude, the integrity of spirit that's really important. And that's quite interesting because Psalm 49 has also been talking a bit about integrity of spirit. And 51, which is coming up, will also be talking about that too. So sacrifice is not necessarily denied, uh, you know, is seen as, as nil, but actually I think it's this idea of offering sacrifice as food for the gods. You know, that do you think I'm really going to be flattered by yeah. um, and bribed and coerced uh, by a sacrifice offered to me? No, it's your heart that's got to be in the right place. I can't, you know, I've, I've got a thousand hills. I don't I don't need sacrifice and, and yeah. the animals are all mine and so on. And I think that's a view that prevailed in Judaism once the temple was destroyed, recognizing very much the importance of the song of thanksgiving. And in some ways, therefore, um, you know, combining that with the, with the Christian view of the psalm, which obviously 
links that sort of sacrifice with the Eucharist and the, and the thanksgiving and the offering that's in that, you know, the Eucharist and so on, the sac- thank, mm. thanking God. Yeah. So it's interesting how there's a certain sort of um, coming together of the Christian and Jewish tradition in the later interpretation. Yeah, I think yeah. it's, it's an interesting psalm set between 49 and 51. There's a lot of connections. Those uh, verses, I'm not wanting all the bullocks and, you know, if I were hungry, why would I tell you? Yeah. <laughs> they seem to me to echo quite a lot of the prophetic material. Yes, about. it's one I mean, of the few... Yeah, it's the psalm one of the comes first and then yeah. the prophet's riffing exactly. on it. Exactly. No, I was just going to say it's one of the few psalms where God speaks. The I is no longer the psalmist. It's God speaking, you know, from, yeah. from um, verses 7 onwards, just as if it was... You know the prophets using the eye of God as if God is speaking. So you're right. Yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's very direct. And, and yet the interesting thing is God is not really addressed as he wasn't in Psalm 49. This isn't a a hymn or a prayer addressing God. This is something which is much more directed to the congregation, just like Psalm 49 was. Well, and that image of the psalm with which it begins, and obviously you you, um, you, you talk quite a bit about the way the Byzantine illustrations sort of use that, which is obviously I do as well, but that that links very much to the way Malcolm uses the, the image of the sun as well. So perhaps we'll, we'll talk about that in, in, in a second. But first of all, may I just sort of thank you again for uh, for joining us for, uh, for these conversations. Um, uh, as you'll, uh, well, if you haven't been, um, if you're joining for the first time, I'm better just explain that they started during um, during lockdown when um, Malcolm wrote these uh, 150 poems responding to the 150 psalms uh, in David's crown. Um, Sue was just completing her sort of three volume psalms through the centuries, which was looking at the, the way the psalms have been received um, over the centuries in both sort of Jewish and, and, and Christian uh, uh, writers uh, and also the the artistic responses to them um, and I was making a selection of the um, of the uh, song, illustrated song translations that I've, I've done over the years um, and well we've now got a Psalm 50. So there's there's quite a few of these conversations we've already had. And if you if you want to uh, to look at some of the earlier ones, there I've now put them on a, on a there. You obviously find them on the YouTube channel, but they're also if you go to the link below, you'll find them uh, on on a web page and on my website. So that's another place to to look at them. Um, but. Malcolm, with this image of the sun, it's very much something you sort of run with in, in this, in, in your in your response. Idea that almost a sunrise that you have. <laughs> yes, that's right. And also in the shear, there's always something magical about getting to 50, you know, and it's a third of the way through. So I think I felt almost an extra wave of energy. Now, of course, I think we can reflect in lots of ways in which 49 and 50 flow together in various ways. And... Um, my landing, my my landing place for the end of forty nine was, of course, an allusion to. Uh, I mean, that my, my whole forty nine thing had had um, had been about you know Christ in a sense as the place of centering. So I, I riff on his phrase, "Your heart, you know, keep where your treasure is, there your heart is." So I would ended, "Your heart's in heaven, keep your treasure there." So that was my starting point, and then I almost so I start, "Your heart's in heaven, keep your treasure there." But then I almost felt the sheer force and beauty of the opening of that psalm and the proclamation, really, that, um, that, that you know, uh, he's called the world from the rising up of the sun to the going down. Out of Zion, God appeared in perfect beauty. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. That this was not a psalm. You know, there's this tension in Christian eschatology, uh, uh, which is a tension also, I think, in, in the Judaic eschatology, between some sort of lift off into heaven or some sort of new creation <laughs> on air. And I felt really strongly that this psalm was 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 pushing me to the the radiance of God shining out in this world. So so that's why my second line, your hearts in heaven, keep your treasure there, for heaven itself is coming to the earth. Um and um, yeah, the, the other thing just about the rising sun because he then goes on to this wonderful thing about all the beasts in the on the hills and all the cattle in the forest and all the birds yeah the the thing that gave me a sort of poetic key for this since it's a psalm and one thinks of choral singing is was was to think of of the you know the day of resurrection as as being preceded by a dawn chorus 
Yes, yes, no, I love that. That seems to me to be something of that is going on in the sun as well. And yes. that's the heat and fire of the sun, which yeah. is actually um, an, a symbol of judgment as well as, you know, something that one seeks out and enjoys. Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. Then it's in that sense, it's sort of, it's a bit, it's a bit like Psalm 19 as well, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah no, no. And I, I, my poem is about judgment, but I, I made my poem not about the judgment of individuals, but as it were, the judgment, the simple discernment between good and evil and the, the dark vanishing, the evil falling away, the, the evil coming to an end um, to make way for the good. Yes, yes. I mean, in, in the, the kind of slightly abstract illustration that I've, I've sort of put to this, I have the, the sort of sun as the sort of, um, that sort of central image, but then it's almost as if the, the whole world is sort of stretched out in kind of little dots <laughs> in, yeah, in front yeah. of that. So it, it's, uh, and you've got these, I mean, so you talk about the, 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 the way this psalm is organized, that there are almost sort of three, three bits that there's the, the first, that first moment, and then there's the, um, uh, you know, addressing the, 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 the nation and then addressing the, you know, those who are, who, um, uh, the wicked, as it were, um, and so I put them in two columns. <laughs> yes, were them. Great, it really made, made the psalm make sense. No, it's great. Yes, yes, that I thought is, the whole so light layout you used. It's very interesting, Roger, the way you use not only visual images to illuminate the psalms, but actually the typographical layout and the arrangement of yes, the text yes. in blocks. And I think that that really adds a lot. I'm sure that's in some ways closer to the tradition almost of the medieval manuscript than the regular printed Bible. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Text image. The two are absolutely speak to each other all the time, don't they? Yeah. One explains the other. Yeah. yeah. But it's interesting yeah. in Byzantine Psalters how you don't just have the sun, but you have Christ personified as the sun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. actually, yeah. you know, that's yeah. also a symbol of both light and and awe and judgment. You know, it's 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 not just one thing, it's many things. But Christ personified as the sun is also coming out of the sun in Psalm 19, and it like a tabernacle is comes out. So, you know, it's identified with the sun in many, many places as the light and fire and judgment yes. with that shining forth idea. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I mean, you have there's, there's also this, I mean, you were talking so about the the kind of prophetic aspect of this that it's it's god sort of speaking but it's also mm -hmm. it's it's god calls isn't it and, yes. and malcolm i mean you make and that's at, at the end of when you have the sort of dawn chorus but you also have um god calling to you through your conscience through your reason mm -hmm. um through your deep imagination which um which i think is very much uh, you know it's um uh i mean it's very interesting the way that the psalm um yeah i mean it is it is prophetic and it is sort of you know, telling the, the Israelites that, that there is more to worship than just sort of, you know, the, um, uh, the, the giving of sacrifice. But, but when it comes to the, the wicked, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of saying all the things that they're doing wrong, but it's not actually, it's not a kind of final judgment. It's, it's, um, I, I will correct you. I, mm. I, I will beg you to consider. It's actually a kind of pleading yeah, with them as well, isn't it? Which I, I, um, uh, is, is, um, yeah, the, the the other thing that uh, is interesting, you know, I'm rereading the psalm just for this conversation, um, but, but also the time, I, I think, you know, we bring now an intense uh, ecological awareness, a sense of our balance with the rest of creation. And I really love this. Um, I mean, all the beasts of the forest are mine, so are the cattle up on a thousand hills. But then in, in Coverdale, at least, in verse 11, I know all the fowls upon the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are in my sight. I mean, that's very beautiful. That's God beholding nature, you know, and knowing it from its very inmost parts. Yes. yes. Entirely yes. out of the context of men with nothing to do with people. Mm. You know, it's partly, I think, a rebuke to to the gathered congregation of Israel to say, you know, yes, yes, you are one of my creatures, but actually I have lots of other ones as well, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Which is like the sort of book of Job, isn't it? That all these yeah. sort of you know, the wild asses who have nothing to do with you at all, they're actually yeah. also part of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, maybe this would be a, a nice, a nice place then to. I mean, there's actually a lot, a lot more we could we could talk about in this art because it's it's a very, it's actually a very rich one. And actually, I, I, I mean, one of the other things you you mentioned, Sue, which I I just can't leave out, uh, is that. Um, that um, in Robinson Crusoe, this is the psalm that Daniel di that um, Robinson Crusoe fi opens yep. when he finds the Bible and he's in despair. It's actually the verse from from this psalm that sort of brings exactly. him new hope, which is um, there he is uh, alone on the yeah. island, having to learn that he can't offer sacrifice anyway. All he's got yeah. is a song of thanksgiving. Slave trader, how can he possibly dare to approach God? And it seems to have yeah. been that in the story that you know actually affected his uh, repentance and and and. Um, uh, you know, giving up the slave trade. So it's interesting now that it's, I think it's verses 12 and 13 about the, you know, the eating of the flesh of bulls and goats and so on. He can't, that, that really struck him. So yeah. interesting. Right, that's yes. fascinating. Part of a journey. Yes. Well, perhaps perhaps we could have the, the, your poem, Malcolm. Okay, so Psalm 50, Deus Deorum. Your heart's in heaven, keep your treasure there, for heaven itself is coming to the earth. Our oh, God is coming and he will appear in perfect beauty. All these pangs of birth will turn to joy as our whole world is born again in him. The pain, the want, the dearth, the dark will vanish in that rising dawn, and all the creatures on a thousand hills, people and beasts and birds, that holy morn will join in one dawn chorus. Glory spills already from beneath that glad horizon, and even now you hear his voice. He calls you through your conscience, calls you through your reason. He calls you through your deep imagination. He calls you to discern his time and season. 